Hi, my name is Tim Albright, and welcome to an Avixa live stream. Uh, I'm your host for the day, and uh, my guest uh, is Avixa CEO, Mr. Dave Labuskis. How are you, sir? Couldn't be better, Tim. Uh, Happy I guess, to be here. I, thanks for, for, for uh, having me and, and joining, uh, joining me here. Um, there's been a, a, a lot of um, news recently. Uh, a couple of, of trade shows have happened uh, here in the, in the industry, so we're going to talk about that. And just kind of, you know, um, answer some questions, I guess, uh, is the best way to, to, to put this. Uh, first and foremost, um, I guess the number one question that um, exhibitors as well as attendees, folks that are, are planning their trips to, a, 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 to Infocom this, uh, this October, again, the, the 27th through the 29th in Orlando, Florida, uh, at the Orange County Convention Center, Right here, as you're as you're sitting, is there any chance in in, in your mind or any chance in uh, in the leadership at Avixa that Infocom 2021 gets canceled? I think if there's anything we've learned in the last two years is that nobody has the um, ability to say something with certainty anymore. Okay. What I will tell you is this: that uh, short of the uh, local government of Orlando or Orange County or Florida or the federal government of the United States telling us that we are violating law and having an event, uh, we will be having Infocom. Well, and, and you, you mentioned the fact that the local as well as state government will get into some of the nuances of holding an event in, in Florida, right? And, and there are some, some limitations that you guys have as exhibitors or as, as organizers um, that folks that are doing it in, let's say, Las Vegas, right, uh, don't. And there's some legal things that we'll get to in a second. When you sit in Orlando in, in, in wherever hotel or, or breakfast on, on, Mon on Saturday morning, uh, October 30th, and you look back at those three days, you look back at that past week because you've got education um, starting on the 22nd, really. What does success look like? What does success of Infocom look like to Avixa? What, what is, how do you define that? Uh, you know, I, I love the way you asked that question because it, it takes you back to the Saturday morning after every Infocom mm -hmm. that uh, you've ever experienced. Uh, Avixa is the Audiovisual and Integrated Experience Association. We are a industry association representing that industry. And we have two purposes set forth by our board of directors. The first is to act as a catalyst for market growth. And the second is to be the hub for the AV profession. I can't imagine that Saturday morning reflection not recognizing that we had served both of those missions over the previous week. There is no greater physical manifestation of the marketplace than a trade show, yeah. nor is there a greater physical manifestation of community than that trade show. And I noticed you just smiled when I talked about community Absolutely. with regards to that trade show. And uh, we just had a board planning meeting in July and we talked about Infocom and Avixa and the AV industry. And throughout all of those conversations, community becomes a part of it. Yep. Um, and trade shows are about commerce, Trade shows are about networking and learning. They're also about community. And I just, I think about what all of us around the world have gone through since January or February of last year and can't imagine spending a day with more than 10 people being anything but a glorious success. And I'm very confident there will be more than 10 people. I, 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 think, I think that is success. 
so you mentioned catalyst and, and hub, and that is that is wording and phrasing that the board has used and, and um, the, the, the the governing body, the, the folks that kind of, you know, the folks that you report to. And and I understand that, uh, and I understand those words. Um, is that is that measurable? Is that a goal line? Is uh, we're sitting here and, and, and the, the NFL starts this week and my beloved Chicago Bears will go undefeated at least until Sunday night. They have a goal line, right? You, you take the football across the goal line. Is Catalyst and Hub, is that a goal line? Is that measurable? Yeah, no, it's directional. Okay. Right, and we, we actually have had spe specific and explicit conversations about that within the board over the, a number of years and we've re-examined those two targets a number of times. Um, it's, it's uh, if I can use an analogy that we've used in those conversations, um, I want you to go west, young man, or uh, I want you to go to San Francisco. Okay. Right, there, there really are two different uh, targets. And, um, I think when you look at the mission of a not-for-profit industry association, it's okay to have directional goals. Okay. Um, I think you can measure your path along the way and evaluate whether or not you are heading in that direction. You can take a look at your allocation of resources to determine whether or not they're targeted effectively. But ultimately, um, being a catalyst for market growth means that we are bringing the market together and we are enabling and or uh, reducing the friction of uh, commerce. So uh, I, I certainly am well aware of the fact that at every trade show or event that Avixa sponsors, people find new jobs, people find new customers, people find new dealers. Um, mergers and acquisitions uh, start oftentimes on our trade show floor. So is, in my opinion, that is very clearly acting as a catalyst for market growth. Based on that definition, that directional goal, yeah. right? Um, if Infocom isn't a success then, based on that definition, does Dave Labuskas have a job on Saturday morning? I hope so. <laughs> what do you understand? So if, if, if Infocom doesn't ma meet those goals of being a catalyst for whatever reason, right? And, you know, the, the, the board calls you up on Monday morning and says, Dave, we're going east, not west. Is, is that an indication that, you know, your position as CEO should be should be reevaluated. I think I think my position as CEO of Avixa should be reevaluated essentially every day, uh, and I think I think. We shouldn't spend too much time talking about my position as but CEO you are the of head Avixa of, of Avixa, though. I mean, because there are so many bigger issues to talk about. But uh, I'll answer the question. I, I, I am. I serve at the pleasure of the board of directors of the association. The board of directors is appointed by volunteers and/or elected by members and has new members entering and leaving every year. And it is their number one responsibility to ensure that the individual that they appoint as CEO is a good steward of the association. Good steward of the association, I would hope, is more broadly defined than by whether or not 45,712 people come through the door in Orlando. Um, but I don't have the privilege of 
defining that. Yeah. That is the membership of our association and our board of directors. So it, it, the first version of the question was Saturday morning. On the second version of the question you gave me till Monday morning, Monday morning, that's pretty yes. good. I, I appreciate was, I that. I was giving the weekend. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone in my position should be making decisions based on whether or not they have a job or not. Okay. I think my responsibilities are far greater than that. And if I am making that as a consideration in the decisions that I put forth and present and drive, that, that probably would be an ultimately important reason for me not to have a job. Somebody during these past months sent me a meme of um, if uh, if I if I wanted to make everybody happy, I would sell ice cream for a living. Um, I don't. My job is not to protect my job. My job is to serve this industry, and I take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. We, we've had a couple of announcements over the last couple of weeks. Um, I just got back from um, CEDIA about a week or so ago, CEDIA Expo in Indianapolis. We'll get to some of those things in a second. That show uh, had a number of folks, a, number, a large number, I, I think that's, that's safe to, to say without me editorializing too much, um, a large number of, of exhibitors pull out. Infocom, as 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 far as I can tell today, I would say two larger booths uh, exhibitors that that that, ha that that inhabited two larger booths. Biant being one of them, Sony being the, here the most recent one. What what do you say to exhibitors um, and and to attendees about the the show map and the transparency? of that show map? Is that being updated? Is that, with, even without announcements, right? Sony sent out an announcement yesterday. Even without an announcement like that, that, that show map, is that being updated and fully transparent on a fairly regular basis? Yeah, yes. There, that okay. is, that's the very simple answer, okay. yes. Um, uh, there's, there's a thousand answers to what you just said, and so I wanna, I wanna try to unpack a little bit of it at, at a time. Um, our our uh, show map, our floor map, is available at the infocomshow.org website, and it is updated on an, a, a real-time basis. If you were exhibiting at Infocom and you canceled, when we change your status to canceled, it changes your presence on the show floor map. Um, now there's a process of canceling, right? Um, pretty much everybody that listens to this uh, conversation has customers and probably has had a customer that's called and said, I don't want to work with you anymore. And depending on who that customer is and the size of that customer, that conversation may take a period of time, not just 20 minutes on the phone that day, but it may take a week or two weeks or three weeks. And during that conversation, there's a back and forth between the exhibitor and Avixa uh, in regards to what their status is gonna be. And some of those conversations end with an exhibitor choosing to cancel. And I respect their choice to, to make that decision. Um, some of those conversations end with the exhibitor deciding not to cancel. And some of them end somewhere in the middle where the exhibitor may change their presence at the event. What has been uh, un, uh, does, is unqualified is the industry and our exhibitors' commitment to uh, be a part of this event and to weigh all of the factors that they face as they make that decision. Um, I know that 2021 is not the year for everybody to be either in the show or at the show. Mm -hmm. And I respect their decision in that regard and anxiously 
look forward to seeing them in 2022, both personally and professionally. Um, but we have 417 exhibitors in this event. And this event is not for one brand or two brands or five brands. This event is for the community. Uh, the people working at this event are in our industry. By holding this event, we bring them back to work. Um, there, are, there are layers of obligation and layers of responsibility that um, stack up when you look at making decisions about this type of event. Um, you, you were at Cedia a week or two mm -hmm. ago, and it wasn't the Cedia that you've been to before. Certainly. Uh, and you and I didn't talk about this before we got together here. But I, I, I'm willing, I'm, I'll take the risk of asking the question without knowing the answer. Yeah. But I'm willing to bet that without fail, every person that you talked to while you were there had a sense of achievement, a sense of rebirth, a sense of starting again, and an optimism of the future that came out of being together face to face with each other and having an opportunity to reconnect with their colleagues. That's, that's the value of an event like Infocom and an event like Cedia. And I, I frankly think it's time, we, 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 need to, we need to not be answering the pandemic of COVID with a response of cancel as our first response. I think we, particularly as an industry of innovators and creators and bringing people together and leveraging technology to create experiences, we, we of all industries should be meeting and beginning and moving forward with this next chapter in our careers, our businesses, our brands, our products. This is, this is the chance to do that. So one of the things that uh, I, I mentioned, the fact that I was at, at CEDIA. CEDIA was held at the Indiana Convention Center. Uh, CEDIA Expo is, is run by um, Emerald. They relied on the Indiana Convention Center's guidelines. Those stated that if you are not vaccinated, they asked you to wear a mask. If you were, you had the option to not wear a mask, right? Um, and, and there were both contingents. There were folks that were masked during the event. There were people that were not entirely, you know, they're on their choice. Talk for a second about the, the health and safety guidelines that Avixa has put in place, the ones that you can put in place, because this is when we get into a little bit of the weeds of legal um, laws, legal laws, but, but laws and, and, and um, directives that the governor of, of Florida has passed, as well as, again, in contrast, what NAB and CES being held in Vegas in Nevada, they have a, a few more options. Yeah, we our, our, our event is taking place in October in Florida. Um, we've worked very hard at identifying what are the protocols that we can put into place, what are the health and safety uh, guidelines that we can put in place in order to uh, ensure that we are delivering a responsible event. Um, the uh, first announcement we made was that we were going to be requiring masks for all attendees. Um, and then secondly, we implemented uh, or, or announced that um, all attendees of Infocom, all employees of Orange County Convention Center, all, everybody that's involved with the event in any way uh, whatsoever is required to either have a negative PCR test for COVID or demonstrate proof of vaccination. Now, it is up to every individual um, with respect to how they meet that requirement. So we are not requiring a vaccine proof. 
what we are offering is a proof of vaccine as an alternative to proof of negative test. Now, that requirement actually becomes more strict uh, depending on the subset of individual that's involved with the show. Many of the exhibitors are requiring that of their employees that are working the show. Um, there is, uh, you alluded to, and I'm not an attorney and I don't even want to pretend to be an attorney on either. TV. Nope. Um, but um, there is um, authorization and authority to require a vaccination of your employees that is different than authorization for requirement of vaccine of your customers in the state in of the state Florida. Of Florida. Okay. And so we are not requiring a vaccine, but we are offering that in lieu of a negative test, you can provide proof of vaccine. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions. I think it achieves the same thing. It, it I understand that statement, but it, it, it is slightly different, right? Um, one is saying that, that you have been vac vaccinated. Um, and currently, um, and I'm saying currently a lot because this is a, a very fluid situation, but currently a full vaccination is, depending on the, on the vaccine, Johnson & Johnson is one shot. Everyone else that I'm aware of is, is two shots, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you have a card of some sort. You guys are, are kind of eventually, you're partnering with the Clear System, uh, mm -hmm. which if you're not familiar with is, um, not you, but the folks watching <laughs> is, um, the, the folks you see at like TSA, right, in, mm -hmm. the, in the airports, you can upload your, your vaccine card and, and have it on your, on your cell phone. Um, but as far as the PCR test, is that going to be something available on site or is it something where you guys are gonna say, hey, here's some locations in Orlando you can go to and then you'll, you'll come to the Orange County Convention Center with that negative test? Yes. Okay. We uh, both. Uh, we'll, we will have limited testing available. Um, by limited, I mean there's a certain number of tests that we're going to buy and okay. be prepared to be able to administer in the convention center. Um, when those run out, then you will need to go somewhere else and we'll be able to direct you to where the close uh, testing centers are. Okay. Um, really quickly about, about that. When you look at um, the kind of the, the trajectory, right? Uh, and again, it's a fluid situation and, and you know, Florida is, um, has, has, has become, you know, kind of a, um, a, a catalyst uh, in the U.S. at least uh, politically, as well as when it comes to, to uh, Delta and, and the variant. The question has, has come up uh, both online as well as uh, a number of, of uh, very well-meaning folks that I've gotten messages from the last couple of days. Is Orlando safe? Is Orlando safe to hold a convention? Is Orlando safe for Infocom to hold the convention? Well, that's a loaded question, right? Slightly? Uh, I, it, it, um, I think the, the, the safe is a term that is self-defined. Okay. And I don't think it's for you or for I to define safe for anyone else. Some people think it's safe to jump out of an airplane, and some people don't. Some people think it's safe to scuba dive, and some people don't. We make decisions about risk every day, every moment, and sometimes very consciously and sometimes less consciously. So let me put that out there first. Then let me address some of the factors that I am looking at because my question isn't, is it safe for you? My question has to be, is it responsible on our parts to organize this event? Are we doing something that is responsible? There's a couple presumptions in your question. Um, first, you, you targeted Florida as the context. Mm -hmm. I would argue that you should target Orlando or Orange County okay. as the context for that question. And as you might expect, you've known me for a little while, uh, I'm looking at statistics for Orlando 
far more frequently than I'm looking at the stock market for my 401k. I am certain. Um, and Orlando, as of this morning, had 77.9% of their population over the age of 18 that have been received at least one of those shots okay. in a vaccine. That is higher than the national average. Um, it continues to go up significantly. I think it's safe to presume that the vast majority of our attendees are only going to be interacting with people over the age of 18. And I think it's safe to presume, as safe as anything is to presume these days, that those who have received at least one shot as of early September will have been fully vaccinated by the time we're there. The positivity rate in Orange County is plummeting. The hospitalization rate is plummeting. The death rate is plummeting. And in fact is zero as of this morning when I looked at it on the plane to come see you. Okay. Um, all of those suggest that there is a trajectory that Orange County, where you're going to fly into, where you're going to have dinner, and where you're going to have an event that has essentially a hundred, I mean, not a hundred percent, let me be very careful, um, very clearly stated either negative COVID tested or fully vaccinated attendees within that. So. You have to look at, is it safe for me to travel? Is it safe for me to be in that vicinity? And is it safe for me to be at the event? And I think we've created an environment that delivers that. But again, that's my definition of safety. That's very different than yours and very different than my wife's, my children's, and everybody that listens here. And I respect their choice. What I what I ask is that they look at the facts and not rely on 140 characters of Twitter. I ask that they look at evidence and make a decision based on that that is right for them. So, so there, there's a couple of, of contrasts here. You, you, Alexa is still holding a number of events, uh, including the, the women's, uh, the, the women's uh, council breakfast. Yeah. You also uh, virtualized the 5k run now not that i'm overly excited about getting up at five o'clock in the morning but i'm doing it right i was i was looking forward to it there were a number of folks uh that had had gathered groups so talk about those contrasts between those those two events specifically and the conversation the, the 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 statement you just made about safety and, and that being you know a personal kind of decision why cancel or virtualize, right? You're not, you didn't cancel the 5K. You, you were allowing folks to do it virtually. You're just not inviting everybody together and still holding the, the women's breakfast. Well, I, we make decisions about events, activities, gatherings, the same way any other business makes decisions about that, which is uh, you offer a product. If people want that product, then you build more of that product and you sell more of it. If you offer a product and nobody buys it, then you probably stop investing in that product. Um, if you take that sort of statement and you compare and contrast the Avixa Women's Council breakfast and the 5K, um, people aren't buying the 5K. Um, and we offered it as an event. It's taken place once in 2019. Mm -hmm. We moved it obviously along with everything else in the entire world to virtual in 2020. We offered it as a hybrid event this year and the uptake isn't, isn't really there. Um, I, I think I think you have to look at the reality of back to that, where do you allocate your resources? Um, it hasn't been a great year for Avixa. Um, canceling Infocom, canceling shows, 
around the world has an impact on our business. And you, you have to look at where do you create the greatest impact with the resources that you have. Okay, I, so last year wasn't a great year for, for Avex. I, I get that you guys had a, you, you canceled Infocom 2020. You did a virtual version of it. There are rumors, rumblings, whatever you want to call it, about the financial viability of Avixa as an organization. So, what would you say about the the viability of the organization um, today? You know, obviously, you know, tomorrow, or as as we look ahead to to twenty two. Uh, thank you for asking me that. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to answer it in more than 140 characters. Um, you, you, know, you keep saying that. It's 280 now. You is it? It is, yes. Is it? Yes. Man, I, I could be rambling on you, you then. You could. You shouldn't, but yes. The Avixa as a business is what we're really talking about yeah. there. So we um, faced the loss of essentially 90% of our operating revenue with the cancellation of events beginning in March of 2020. But we, as an industry association and as a business, have run an extremely prudent business um, for well before I became CEO. Um, we are conservative organization and we have saved money. Um, we, are, um, we are fine as far as the viability of Avixa as a business. Um, we were significantly impacted with our business model. Uh, we restructured our business. I unfortunately needed to, in that restructuring, uh, let a number of people go from the organization, as many people in our industry have had the unfortunate experience of doing. Um, many of them were people that had been with the organization for many years yeah. uh, and have done fabulously for themselves in the interim. And I couldn't be happier and prouder for them happier for them and prouder of them. Um, but we are, not, um, we, are, we are not in a position where there is any reason to presume that we are going to file bankruptcy, for lack of a different way of saying it. Um, the, the old saying, you save for a rainy day, and we've saved for a rainy day, and we pulled out the galoshes. Yeah. Um, the organization has also, uh, incidentally, um, very successfully delivered um, a profitable trade show in China, both in 2020 and 2021. Um, we delivered a very successful trade show in conjunction with Cedia in Europe in 2020. Uh, and um, I'd, I'm happy to have a detailed conversation with anybody that has questions about this. And ultimately, it's, it's your association. Um, but the, the rumors of our demise are uh, prematurely reported. All right. You were talking about uh, the, uh, the 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 five k, and how that compares and contrasts with with the women's breakfast. The 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 comparison and contrast of the five k and the women's uh, breakfast at Infocom is really a comparison and contrast of where do you allocate your resources and. Um, if you look at the impact and the reach that our councils are having uh, across the industry and the uh, popularity of the women's breakfast at Infocom, it's, it, it sells out every year. The 5K hadn't been so popular. It is an experiment that we started in 2019. It's only taken place once. 
In 2020, we converted it to virtual. And in 2021, we're leaving it as a virtual event. And I'm not confident that it will exist in 2022. We make decisions about products and offerings the same as every other business does. Um, with respect to, are we delivering value? Are we making an impact? Are we serving to one of those two goals that we have in this, as an association? Um, we are freed from um, shareholder wealth accumulation. There are no shareholders that are looking for wealth from what we do. Yeah which allows us to focus on and reinvest all of the revenues that we have into serving our industry. Um, but we have to reinvest them, not just spend them, right? When we, when we make decisions on programs that we do, we, we have to look at what is the marketplace for that, what is the interest in that, what is the demand for that. And ultimately, we are a not-for-profit, but I can't spend more money than I make on an ongoing basis and stay in business. Hmm. All right, uh, before I let you get out of here and, and we'll turn the corner here, let's talk about refunds for a second. Um, when an exhibitor, let, let, I'll pick on Cedia again for a second. Um, a number of exhibitors, when they pulled out, they forfeited their, the fees that they had paid for those booths. Even though they didn't exhibit, even though technically the the show floor was, was not that part of the show floor was was not used. If you talk to the folks at, at uh, Emerald, they will tell you that they still had to pay for for that though, that show floor though, uh, even though there was nobody there. Talk for a second about the folks that may be considering um, not exhibiting, not showing at Infocom. Um, and Infocom and Avix's policy on those refunds. Yeah, well, it, I, I actually can't talk intelligently about all of the specifics, but there's a very clear and unambiguous contract that an exhibitor enters into with a trade show organizer, in this case, Avixa for the Infocom show. And it essentially says, I want this space on the trade show floor. And the organizer says, okay, that'll cost you this much, and you need to pay a percentage of it now in order to keep that. Yeah. And if you don't make that payment, then you lose that space. If you do make that payment, then you have a period of time before you make another payment, and then another period of time before you finish paying for your space, yeah. right? Uh, that's, there's, not, there's nothing unusual about that, right? A trade show organizer, Infocom, begins spending that money before they even have it, right? We're, we're working on and planning and developing the 2023 event right now and spending money on delivering that event. So you, your day job, you work for a solution provider. Yep. Let's say that a client hires you to do a 10 month install on an office campus. And two months before they're planning on moving in, they call you and say, Tim, we've decided we're not gonna move in. And we want a refund for everything we paid you for the last eight months. I'm guessing you probably wouldn't say sure. Probably not. You've staffed that project. Yep. You've sent your project manager there, your team there. You've bought product. You've installed it. You've delivered it. It's not your fault they've decided not to move into the campus. You may work with them on the costs that you haven't had in the final eight weeks of the project, but you're not going to give them that money back because they entered into an agreement with you. You delivered on that agreement and they've made a decision not to deliver on it. So that's the, that's the contract piece, right? But let's, let's, let's talk about reality, right? Yeah. Um, I and my team have all told any exhibitor that they should contact us if they're considering canceling. We, we wanna work with them. We wanna find a solution for them. It's very similar again to the example I just hypothetical created of 
um, how do you work with a customer that is a partner, right? And the Infocom event is more than a business transaction. The Infocom event, again, is a physical manifestation of the AV professional community. And we want to do right by people. But we also are running a business, and we are also delivering a responsible event that we believe is going to deliver significant value. If you don't agree with that, I respect your decision. I respect that choice. But I, as a organization, have invested for over a year in making sure I could keep your commitment. Mm -hmm. And P.S., everybody that exhibits in trade shows understands this. Like, uh, the, the people, a, a lot of people that are raising this issue just don't understand how this business works. Some people that are raising it understand, and mm -hmm. maybe they're raising it even though they understand how this business works. But if, if you, as an exhibitor, sign a contract with Avixa in January of 2020 for a trade show that was going to be delivered in October of 2021, and I didn't do any work on planning that event, on organizing that event, on marketing that event, you would see that as a default in contract. Mm -hmm. and doing all that work costs money and that money is spent. I think if we were, so last year's different. So last year's contract was also unambiguous. If I cancel the event, I owe you a refund minus prorated costs. Yeah. I didn't detract any prorated costs and I had incurred a lot of costs because it was extenuating circumstances and it wasn't I didn't feel like it was the right thing to do I, I f we believe that holding this event is the right thing to do and I recognize and respect the fact that others have the right and will disagree with me in that regard um, and we believe we are delivering incredibly, or going to deliver an incredible experience for those that attend. I think the considerations that people are taking into place as they make these decisions include the contracts that they've signed. All right. Well, let's, you, you mentioned the, the people that will attend. Um, let's talk about attendance. When, when you look at sitting here today, um, I would, how frankly, many people are going to be there? Well, yes. How many people are going to be there? All right. So, uh, I. And, and what is the makeup that, 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 that you know of? Right what's now? the temperature going to be? It's it's. It's Orlando in October. It'll right. be about seventy. We, okay. <laughs> so probably about seventy, right? Yeah. So, but we can't forecast the weather, and I can't forecast the number of people that are going to be there. So, what are we looking at? We yeah. look at trends. We look at registrations to date. Um, when we. When we organized this show, we told our exhibitors that we anticipated that we would have about 70% of the attendees that we'd had the last From time we were in Orlando. Right. And just for, for reference, that was about 40,000 It was about 45,000. Okay. A little under. Um, but we'll, we'll round it, as my, my family calls it, it. Those are CEO numbers. Like, I, I round. You round to 45, I'll round to 40, and we'll okay. be somewhere in the somewhere middle. In, okay. So we had, we had advertised that... We, and, and had set the expectations that it'd be about 70%. We've since down, we've, we've downgraded that to be about 60%. Okay. Now, what we do as an organ, what every trade show organizer does is track registrations on days out, right? And you've got, um, so we have registrations about, we're about 40 some days out from the show, depending on whether you talk about when the ribbon's cut or when class is open, that type of thing, right? Um, we are tracking ahead of what we initially projected okay. of that 70% compared to 2019. Um, the problem is, will they come? I, I don't want to be disingenuous and suggest that every single person that has registered is going to come. And the other problem is, will the registration pattern follow that of 2019? I doubt that. Um, what I have is 417 really committed exhibitors that really want to have a successful event. 
We have a core of thousands of people that have registered for the event, people that have registered for education, people that have booked hotels. Um, but I don't know if they're going to go up or go down between now and the end of October. Uh, I think it is um, very, we, we are currently stating that we anticipate 24,500 people at the event. I think if we deliver that, it would be seen as wildly successful by even our greatest detractor. And I think those brands that decided not to participate would likely um, be, uh, they'd, they'd be questioning that decision. Um, but I, don't, I, I can't promise a number. Yeah. The, the attendance, the, the, what I can also say is those that have registered to date um, about 90% of them are attendees as opposed to exhibitor staff. So not everybody knows that in that 40 to 45,000 number includes exhibitor staff. Everybody knows that. Okay. Um, that number would normally be 20-ish percent okay. of the registered attendees at this time because re the exhibitors are starting to sort of assign their staff and they're having them do the registration and that type of thing and attendees do it later okay. um, that percentage is actually much lower right now we actually have a far higher percentage of our registered attendees are actual attendees not exhibitor staff so that's a good thing for the exhibitors um, I, I'm not trying to to duck the answer I, I threw out a you lot of numbers a number, um, and and I think they, they are practical, but I, I want to absolutely put the caveat there that my crystal ball was never all that clear. And in COVID years, it's become really cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> Last year is, is, is one of those years that I will probably tell my grandchildren about because I remember very vividly certain points in time. Um, I remember you and I uh, sitting I at the at the Rye in, in Amsterdam the last the last time ISC was in Amsterdam, and conducting an interview uh, was not anything like this <laughs> had nothing to do with this, um, somewhat of the industry, uh, you know, COVID and and um, was was just kind of on the horizon. It was coming out of, of um, parts of, of Asia, and, and we were just started hearing it and and. I want to say it was like six weeks later. You and I sat on a, on a Zoom call as you explained why we were why you were canceling Infocom 20. Um, then that got moved and, and reimagined uh, as a virtual show. Right? There are some folks, and we mentioned you know uh, Biamp has, has pulled out their concern for the health and safety of their employees and that you know their decision. There are some organizations, some companies, some integrators that certainly won't send their employees to Infocom for, for similar reasons. So there is a, a contingent of some folks who either would have gone to Infocom in 21 um, or has never gone but is interested in some of the offerings. What are the provisions, what are the, the, the opportunities for folks who cannot or, or simply don't feel comfortable being in Orlando the last week of October to still get some of the education, so to, to still get some of the of the connection uh, and and some of the catalyst building that that Avix is looking for. There are um, this this whole area is continuing to just explode, right? And and um, if uh, as we as I tell stories to my grandkids some days, it's going to be about you know I. I was there when, mm -hmm. and it's going to be talking about this sort of evolution of the digital and physical space and how they interface with each other and how, you know, the first, the first efforts were um, cute in retrospect, right? Um, the, that, that is one word for it, <laughs> yes. The, Specifically for Infocom 21, yeah. we have a sneak peek of Infocom 21, which is a virtual event that's taking place a couple weeks before the actual event that's in person. We have um, content from the 
physical event that is being streamed and available to people that can't or choose not to go to Orlando. And then we have a post Infocom event that is 100% uh, virtual that or digital, I should say. I'm trying to break my habit of virtual because it's real. It's just digital, yeah. not physical. Um, and uh, that'll be an opportunity for sort of a reaffirmation of conversations that attendees had with exhibitors, as well as there'll be um, on-demand content from the show itself that'll be available for a period of time following. So it's a balance, right? Um, I don't uh, you, you know, initially we, we did, and I'm really proud of my team and the event that we put on in 2020, Infocom Connected. Uh, it was uh, nothing short of miraculous that, you know, we were able to, that we, I, I, that implies that I was involved in it, that my team was able to go from the, not only the trauma, but the business challenge of canceling an event of the magnitude of Infocom. And here's my, you, you said fluid situation 12 times. I'll say pivot now for the first oh. time in our interview. Pivot to a, a digital event of a scale that nobody, quite frankly, probably nobody had ever delivered before. Um, and we filled the time and we filled the space. And again, we delivered on community. We delivered on giving people an opportunity to gather the best we could in June of 2020. Um, I, don't, I don't think um, online exhibitor floors, like trade show floors, we did that at our event at Infocom Connected. I don't know that I've ever spoken to an exhibitor that's been happy with those. Um, and so we're not gonna do those again. Um, they've evolved dramatically. The platforms have evolved dramatically. My, my focus with regards to this, my, my view of this part of the world is, first and foremost, not look at how do you make Infocom digital, but look at how Avixa as an association delivers on our responsibilities for Catalyst for Market Growth and hub of AV community, leveraging a set of tools, a portfolio of capabilities, one of which is physical events, another of which is digital presence. And I think you have to celebrate those separately and deliver those separately, uh, leveraging their strengths and weaknesses. When you participate in a digital event, Tim, I know a lot about you. I know what pages you went to. I know who you chatted with. I know which exhibitor sponsors links you clicked on. I know how much time you spent in session one, two, three, four, and five. Knowing that about you makes you pretty valuable for me to present to one of the sponsors of that event and help them identify exactly the type of people they want to talk to. I can't do that in Orlando. I can bring you into the trade show floor. I can get you excited and enervated and, ex and, and exploring, but I can't tell exhibitor A that this is who that individual is. But I think down the road we'll be able to do some of that. Um, and of course it's all balanced around what level of privacy you want to have with regards to your data and respecting that. Uh, there is a, a book that uh, was recommended to me years ago that I, I read and just sort of just completely consumed, which was The Martian. I don't know if you read that book or not. Um, but about a year after the book was published, um, a movie came out. The very different um, story delivery of the same story. Um, I think y you look at any great novel, and many of them have great movies that they inspired, but they weren't put the book on a or a podium, and put a camera on top of it, and film somebody turning the pages. Yeah. Right? It's taking the story and using a different medium, using a different series of 
um, capabilities and delivering the same story, but in a completely different medium. To me, that's where we're heading when you start to look at physical and digital. And then the commercial aspect of it is you can extend the engagement that's created by meeting somebody at a trade show in a digital community. And you can use a digital community to draw people to a physical event. I mean, we see it happening now, like uh, the AV, AV tweets, yep. right? Uh, we do a, you do a meetup, right, at the show, yep. right? That, that's a perfect example of digital community first that is reinforced by physical presence. But there are people at that physical presence that get introduced to the digital community. And again, if we are going to serve as a hub for the community and we're going to serve as a catalyst for market growth, ultimately that's about convening people. It's about bringing people together. They'll come together and then learn from each other, do business with each other, teach each other, become friends, employ each other. That, that's what an association does. All right. As as before, I let you go. I, I want you to to talk for a second um, to kind of uh, just to two different people. One is is an exhibitor. One is a an attendee. Whether that attendee is a consultant or an integrator or a, a, a tech manager, if they are sitting here either watching this or contemplating, listening, reading back, whatever, it, it, and they are. The best way to put this is on the fence about attending Infocom 21 in Orlando. I don't want you to convince them. I just, what would you say to them? First and foremost, make the decision for yourself about whether or not you think it's a responsible decision, right? And, I, and, and maybe I, I want to back off of that because that sounds sort of um, patronizing, right? Because by definition, they should make that decision. Well, so it, it's I, necessarily I don't want to I mean, respect it, it. Yeah. Right? So uh, we, we were chatting before we, we did this that your, your kids are younger than my kids, yep. right? So there are people that have young children at home. There are people that are um, immune compromised. All of these factors are things that those individuals need to consider. What I can offer them is in that consideration, things to consider is we are going to have a vibrant event. We will almost assuredly have additional brands that decide to cancel from this event. But this event is not about one brand or one stand, one booth. This event is about restarting. This is about, you know, delivering on the opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, you, you just, in your consideration, consider the fact of who you've had Zoom calls with, who Google Meetup calls or Teams calls with. Almost assuredly, it is with the group of people that you work with on a day in and day out basis you're actually communicating with them more likely than you had been before. But the people that you are not communicating with are those people that are outside of that inner circle. Um, you and I have not had a Zoom call to meet and talk about how the industry is doing and where it's going and what you're hearing and what I'm hearing because we're not in an inner circle with each other. Um, but we would absolutely have that conversation at Infocom. Mm -hmm. And the outcome of that conversation would be valuable to both of us. Um, those conversations are going to take place. Uh, there will be less people at the Orange County Convention Center this year than the last time we were there in 2019. There will be less exhibitors than were there the last time we were there. But I, I am certain that there will be far more people there than any trade show you went to in 2020 in North America. And I think, I think it's important to, I, I know I sort of said that tongue in cheek, but, yeah. but it, I think reference points are important, right? Yeah. These are relative, these are decisions based on relative evaluation, not 
back to your first question, like on off, binary, zero, one, these are, these are gradient answers here. And uh, I think this is an opportunity to be forward, present as a brand. I think this is an opportunity to discover and see and touch and hear technologies that you haven't been able to experience for almost two years or over two years at an Infocom. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to me to be an amazing opportunity to miss. Um, but I think there's a lot of people that probably have a good reason in their mind to miss it, and I respect that. And, and I want to make sure I'm absolutely clear about that. Um, I don't think it's my place to convince somebody to attend. I think it's my place to hold a responsible event, to set a culture of safety, and to create an environment where commerce and networking and learning can take place. And we're gonna offer hundreds of educational sessions and speakers and the, the, the magic of Infocom will still be there. We faced this before, right? Yeah. I mean, in, in, in the financial downturn in 2008, you know, the Infocom show in 2009 had, had a lot of big brands cancel, had a lot of big brands downsize, had a lot of people not attend. But the people that did attend, they learned, they grew, they met new people, they saw new technologies, deals were done, uh, and, and, and we survived. That's what I would. That's what I would say. Maybe I'd have to say it a little more succinctly. They'd be less patient than you. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. My kids don't think I'm patient. So, <laughs> all right, um, Dave Labusco, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, not that anybody watching this doesn't know this, but but if they want to find out more information about Infocom and the show, how do they do that? Well, they can find out about Infocom show at Infocom at the Infocom Show dot org uh, website. Uh, avixa at avixa dot org. Um, myself at dlabuskis at avixa.org um, and uh, I am also want to make sure that in my closing I, I thank you. I think um, I think we as a human race are dependent upon people in our lives mm -hmm. and I think there is a presumption of I think we I think I think we need to make sure that we have dialogue and conversation and reach understanding with each other. Yeah. And I am always a hundred percent committed to that as an individual and I appreciate the chance to answer the questions that you had. Well, I appreciate your time, sir. Um, thank you. Thanks to uh Avixa for, for having us and uh for helping or letting me uh, uh host this uh Avixa live stream. Uh for me, for Tim Albright don't I, I don't don't follow me on Twitter. Um, I, I mentioned the fact that the Bears are starting on Sunday. They are, uh, and they will be 0 and 1, and that's fine. Uh, but go by the website avnation.tv. That's avnation.tv. Uh, you can find all the information about me there. Thanks so much for joining us.